to look at pulse filtration, we're looking at similar examples in today's class. And there's going to be quite a bit of calculation that you're going to do on your own. The questions we're going to look at are the sort of questions we're expecting on the midterm. So we were looking at this last time here and said that consider this membrane where we've got a feed coming to it. And initially, we're closing this retentate valve up at the top over there. And then we're going to allow the system to come to steady state. So initially, this valve is closed. I then wait for this to circulate through till I get the desired concentration, open the valve, and then I bleed out my retentate at steady state. So the feed that my membrane sees is not actually a feed that's here in the feed tank. The feed coming into the membrane is that of the retentate being recycled plus the nuclear in the tank. So we expect the concentration seen by the membrane is actually much greater than the feed that we're processing in the feed tank. Leaving the permeate then is the flow rate of the permeate and our regular assumption of the concentration of the permeate is, is zero. So one thing that, that often throws people with this sort of setup is that where do we take the concentrations, right? We don't know what this intermediate concentration is over here coming into the membrane. We know this concentration in the tank, that's my full tank over there, but depending on my recycle ratio, I'm going to get a varying concentration actually coming into the membrane. What I'm going to show you next is that we don't really need to know that. All we do need to know is the <laughs> concentration, the retentate flow, and the permeate flow. So if we consider the system, I'm just going to redraw it slightly, shown up there. We've got my heat tank over here. Coming in, and then if I redraw that, I'm going to just flip the membrane unit 90 degrees. We have my membrane unit over here. And I'm going to take my retentate back on the recycle feed that in. <coughs> my permeate will leave over here still, so that's QP, the flow rate of the permeate. And my flow rate of my retentate is measured over here, so QR. So this retentate stream gets split depending on the recycle ratio, <coughs> and I'll bleed off a, a, a flow rate QR. So I manipulate that valve position, and whatever flows out that valve leaves, whatever doesn't gets recycled back. So we don't know the speed coming in here. This is unknown concentration over there. But what we really care about at the end is not what's going in there. Our equation we call for measuring this performance of this membrane is JV is some constant given by the mass transfer coefficient multiplied by the log of a given wall concentration CW divided by a concentration down here. We call that C bulk. Okay. So that equation actually does not depend on the feed. We don't need to know the feed concentration in order to use this equation to, to calculate that flux. Because this concentration here used in the denominator is which one? Retentate's concentration. So I use CR over here. So I don't actually require to know what this concentration is coming into the membrane. So from a mass balance point of view, I'm really just considering that as my boundary. All I need to know is the speed coming in over here. We'll call that Q0. It will have concentration C0. Leaving then is my permeate concentration CP, which we assume to be zero, with the flow rate QP, and then the retentate concentration and retentate flow. So P plus bleed setup really doesn't change any of our analysis so far. We are, I, can, I can redraw this diagram as our regular diagram that we've been using up to now, which is simply this where I've got a feed of Q0, C0, I've got a retentate leaving here of QR, CR, 
and I've got a permeate leaving here of EP. So this diagram on the left can be redrawn as shown there on the right, whether we have a feed plus believer or not. So we can just collapse it down to a much simpler representation. Okay, so we looked at a case study in the class last week, or last time, we looked at an example based on this. We said it was a feed plus bleed circuit. So let's go back to that, just as a quick recap. Uh, so here was this example question we looked at. Oh, sorry, I didn't say it was feed plus bleed. It was just a regular membrane. But whether it was feed plus bleed or just this regular setup, it doesn't matter. Our analysis and our equations that we use to model this do, do not change. Okay, so that's a key, key um, result from that. And it's, it's a really satisfactory result because it simplifies what we're going to look at next in today's class. And that is to take a look at what happens when we put these membranes in parallel. So recall last class then, we, we drew that diagram that I have up there on the whiteboard and we were just starting with this example over here. So let's just uh, let's recap where we were then. We were looking to treat 50 meters cubed per day of waste coming in with a concentration of 4 kilograms per meter cubed. So C0 over here is 4 meters kilograms per meter cubed. Q0 we calculated last time as 2.5 meters cubed per hour. And our aim of this case study is to find the number of modules we need in parallel. So here's my first module, second module. I have multiple of them, and then my final module. Each one of these modules has the same area A, capital A. So we need to find that total area A so that we can get this permeate and retentate concentration as desired. So permeate concentration is always zero, so we know that. I do not know QP at the moment. I don't know what that flow of QP is going to be. I do know what my retentate concentration is. I desire that to be 20 kilograms per meter cubed. And I don't know what QR is. So we ended off the class at the end by saying, well, what are my unknowns? My unknowns here are QR, QP, and this area A. So three unknowns. Now, when we ended off that question, there was the one uncertainty is, well, if I'm going to calculate my area, one thing I'm going to just tell you right now, and then you're going to prove it to yourself afterwards, is that we can collapse all these units down into a single unit. Okay? And the reason for that, here's an intuitive reasoning for it. Let's take a look why. What is the concentration that this membrane sees coming in at the feed? C0, four kilograms per cube. So this one is four kilograms per cube. Each one of these concentrations that the membrane sees is 4 kilograms per meter cube. What is the concentration leaving in the retentate for each membrane? CR, 20 kilograms per meter cube. Okay. When we model up these membranes, the equation that we're going to use to, to model that is this guy over here. Okay. We're given HW is 0 0.02, and we're given CW of 25. So this equation only depends on CR. CR is the same for all these membranes. So conceptually, from a, a modeling and from a problem-solving point of view, we can collapse this down to a single membrane. So when we're calculating that area A, we're going to just calculate the, the total area and then divide that by 30 meters squared to calculate the number of modules. So give that, a, give that problem a go. Three equations that you're going to need to solve for the three unknowns. Five minutes.
QP plus the bar. So the overall bar of the metric balance is the media balance on the solid. Balance on the solid. I don't understand why they use QP over A for the flux. Because flux measures what's going through the membrane, QP goes through the membrane, not QI. Solute balance on the flux, what would that look like? As the CNR times QR equal uh, CR times QR. And then you would have a CP times QP. Okay, so plus CP times QP, but that term reduces to zero because CP is zero. Okay. So three equations, three unknowns. Two of them are non-linear, one is linear. So we can solve for QR because we know <coughs> we know CR. Yeah. Okay, so 20 the CR, so we can call that QR. So QR equal to C naught Q naught divided by CR. So that's 2.5 times 4 divided by 20 is 0.5 minus Q power. So QR then is not known. CR is Okay, so two unknowns left. What one will we solve for next? P. So if we know which equation we're going to use for QP, Q naught minus QR. So QP. So that's 2.0. <coughs> So the next 
question then takes a look at that series circuit. So we've looked at parallel circuits. Now let's take a look at what series circuits are doing. And I'd like you to take a look at just the first part. The second part is too difficult to do in class. You're going to do that on a spreadsheet in the next assignment. But let's consider these two units in series now. This is a different problem. We're feeding mem uh, material to that first membrane, and then the retentate from the first membrane becomes the feed now for the second membrane. And what I'm saying here is let's consider each membrane to be 30 meters squared. What is the concentration leaving membrane one and the flow rate leaving membrane one, and what is the concentration of flow leaving membrane two? Notice we don't know the outlet from CR2 this time. So uh, this is, I'm, what I'm doing is I'm continuing on the previous problem in the sense that I'm using the feed conditions. And we're going to just find what this membrane does. So um, can I erase this board over here anyway? OK, so let me take this diagram and I'll simplify that feed plus we leave using our our notion now that we know we can collapse that down to a more simpler representation. I can write and redraw this diagram with C0 equals 4 kilograms per meter cubed and a Q0 of 2.5 meters cubed per hour. So I know my entry conditions. I'm going to take off a retentate stream and that's going to become the feed. We call this QR1 and CR1. This is going to be our standard way of naming these. That's going to be my feed to the second membrane in series. And QR2 and CR2 are going to be located. We also have the permeate leader. So QP1 and CP1. And for the second membrane, we have QP2 and CP2. <coughs> we also know that the membranes are of 30 meters squared. So A1 is 30 meters squared, and A2 is the same. For two, three minutes, plan your strategy for calculating what QR1, CR1, QR2, and CR2 are going to be. Yeah, we're using the same flux equation from the previous example. So what's your strategy for calculating QR1 and CR1, QR2 and CR2? <coughs> A little bit similar to the previous problem, but different enough that it's not going to be solvable and straightforward now. So plan, work through that. You don't need to actually solve it. In fact, you, you like you don't have the time to solve it here right now. This was a question from the midterm last time. Yeah. 
the suggestion that we would do is to rewrite this equation in terms of QR1, put it into the third equation. Okay, so now you've eliminated QR1 here, but you put a QP1 into its place. Write it in terms of QP1, put it back into equation two. Okay, so let's take a look at that. QR1. equal to Q0 minus QP1. Okay, put that into equation 3. Equation 1, 2, and 3. So we start off with equation 1, put it into 3. So we could now write that as QR1, oh, sorry, CR1 I should say, is equal to Q0 C0 divided by Q0 minus QP1. And then put that into equation 2. Equation 2 then is written as QP1 times A divided by A where did you want to substitute it into? Oh, this equation? Okay, so make this the subject of the equation so in equation 3, wait a second QP1. There's no QP1. Okay, so solve this for QP1. Okay? You see how this gets messy? Yeah. It's going to be easier if you put that equation in, but it's just one of them you solve for QP1. So put this equation into the second one. Solve this for QP1. Okay? What are, you, what are you heading towards? Right? What are we all what are we stumbling around here? What do we want from this? Well when you solve for QP1, then you can solve for QR1 and then you pass out the second set. Well let's not forget let's not even get to the second set. We just want to solve the first system. We, we don't know anything about the second system. We just want to solve the first system. Once we solve the first system, we can take that over to the second system. Spend a minute or two writing out what your approach is going to be. What what do you want from this often? You are one. Yeah. Yeah. So we've got through we've got our three equations, our three unknowns that we know. But what do we want to now do with these three equations? <laughs> Take a minute or two and figure it out. <laughs> Thank you. 
Okay, so our goal here with this, and whenever we've got equations like this, is we want to find and reduce them to a single equation in one unknown. Okay, so we want one equation where we can write f of x is equal to zero and then solve to find what x gives me zero. So x is my one unknown, I want to reduce and find this equation f in terms of one variable x and set it equal to zero. So in this case, I don't have a variable x. I want, I'm going to use one of these other variables that I'm solving for. But the idea is to sub, sub in to get one equation in one unknown that you can work with. It. So we were pretty much all, almost there um, the previous time. There's, there's, there's several ways to do this, right? So the one I'm going to show is one that uh, works, but there's, there's a, you may find another alternative. So we've rearranged here for QR1. Let's uh, take it and put it into equation three. We write equation three in terms of CR1 is then equal to Q0, C0 divided by QR1. QR1 sub in here is equal to Q0 minus QP1. So we had that there a little earlier before I erased it. But what you can say is that let's take equation two We write for QP1, QP1 is equal to A1 times 0 0.02 the log of 25 divided by CR1. Now if I take that QP1 and sub it in over here into that prior equation, my only unknowns are CR1. Once I've substituted that in, this equation here on the right hand side is only a function of CR1. Once I substitute it in here, I know Q0, I know C0, and I have CR1 over here. So I can get one messy ish equation in terms of CR1. But the CR1 is the. <laughs> you don't like it. It's not, it doesn't have to be analytical. We're solving f of x is equal to zero. We've learned methods to, to do that. Okay, so let's take a look at that. f of x is equal to zero, we're heading towards, and so if we make that substitution in there, we get an equation that looks like CR1 is equal to Q0, C0 divided by Q0 minus A1. 0.02 log of 25. Or if you rearrange that then a little bit more clearly so that you get it as f of x is equal to 0, we can show, uh, just bring this denominator out here to the, to the left and set that equal to 0, we get f of CR1 is equal to Q0 times CR1 minus CR1A times 0 0.02 log of 25 divided by CR1 minus Q0 C0. So I know Q0, I know A, I know Q0 and C0. So I'm only solving it to C on one. What is a reasonable initial check or guess for C on one? What is a lower bound for C on one? What's an upper bound for C on one?
But there is an upper bound on the CR one. No, that the lower bound is four. What's the upper bound to CR one? So we're feeding four, we expect more than four leaving. 25. Yeah, so 25 is my wall concentration. That's when my membrane totally gels up and doesn't work anymore. Okay, so bounds between z uh, 4 and 25. Okay, so what, where, where would you start? What might be an initial guess? So let's maybe take 10 as an initial guess. So F of CR1 equals 10. Substitute it over there. For that, you get uh, CR1 times 2.5. So that's 10 times 2.5 is 25. Minus 10 times 30 times 0 0.02. 25 over 10 minus Q0 C0. That Q0 C0 is going to constantly appear here. It's always the same value. So 2.5 times 4, that's minus 10. So minus. Okay, so evaluate that and then you get 9.5. We we'll want that to be 0. We can set that equal to zero. We found the CR1 value that solves for the system. Okay, this is 3D stuff, right? So straightforward. What's the next iteration? CR1 going to be higher or lower? You take a look at this equation. Should I make CR0 higher or lower? Lower, so I can make this term, that very first term, smaller. I've also got a CR, CR1 multiplier here. So if I make it lower, I reduce this term and this term, bringing f of CR1 down. So perhaps my next iteration is, I know my lower bound is 4. Now my upper bound is 10. OK, let's go for 7. Plug that in. You get 17.5 minus 4.2 log of 25 over 7 minus 10, and that's equal to 2.15. <coughs> the upper bound is 25 because that's the, what, that's the gel concentration. That numerator 25 is CG, it's the gel concentration. So Concentration above that cause the membrane to have zero flux. Yeah, 25 is long. That's why we use that formula. So next iteration, the query mechanic. Six, let's try that. Okay, so let's uh, get you 15 minus 3.6. <coughs> log of 25 over 6 minus 10, and then you get minus 0.138. So we've crossed 0 to 6.2, 6.1, let's try it, let's say CR1. You don't need to do another iteration, right? Simply just say, look, look at this. It's so close to zero over here. It's just a little higher than six. 6.1, 6.05, 6.2. Any of those would be reasonable values. We don't expect you to do infinite number of iterations here. So 6.1 kilograms per meter. Once we have CR1 now, we're easily able to calculate QR1 and Q. P1. Okay, so QR1 <coughs> equal to, you can plug back into those mass balances we had earlier and show that that's equal to 1.65 meters cubed per hour. And then QP1 is equal to 0.85.
So let's just uh, make sure that those seem reasonable. So CR1, we just calculate uh, 6.1. Uh, so that seems right. We're going from 4 to 6. QR1 is the retent tank flow. That's 1.65. And okay, so we're coming in at 2.5. 1.6 is leaving in the retent tanks, and the permeate is the remainder, 0.85. Second membrane's results, um, and as a practice, 